Access to Democracy is made possible by donations from the following organizations. Thomson Reuters, a global company with expertise and insight to unravel complex situations in the areas of law, tax, compliance, government, and media. Their worldwide network of journalists and editors keep customers up to speed on relevant global events. Thomson Reuters, the answer company. The division championship Minnesota Twins are looking to go all the way to the World Series in 2024. Bolstered by inspirational shortstop Carlos Correa, a healthy Brian Buxton, and rookie phenom Royce Lewis, plus a pitching staff led by Pablo Lopez and an outstanding bullpen featuring Johan Duran, the Twins are the best bargain in the major leagues, and Target Field is the best venue in baseball. Sheridan Dulas and Kins, PA, a family and criminal defense law firm, has been serving clients in Dakota County and throughout Minnesota for over 40 years. Ranked a tier one best law firm by US News and World Report every year since 2009, Sheridan Dulas and Kins are here to help you in your most difficult life circumstances. Established in 2007, 45th Parallel Spirits was among the first 50 micro distilleries in the United States. Based in New Richmond, Wisconsin, all aspects of production occur at our facility. If you're interested in visiting and learning more about the 45th Parallel Distillery, please check our website and plan a visit to tour our facility and taste our spirits. Truestone Financial, with locations in Minnesota and Wisconsin, has proudly served as members since 1939. Truestone engages, educates, and supports its members to ensure they have the tools to empower their financial well-being. Truestone Financial, your neighborhood credit union. Learn more at truestone.org. Welcome to Access to Democracy. Today we're going to have uh, another medical segment. Uh, the topic will be uh, diabetes. I'm Dr. Jeffrey Thompson. I'm a retired Mayo Clinic physician, and uh, as I mentioned, today's topic will be on diabetes, and our guest is uh, Dr. Adrian Vela. We're very pleased to have him. Dr. Vela is a professor of medicine at the Mayo Clinic College of Medicine and Science, and he's been a staff endocrinologist since 2001 after completing what's considered a very prestigious clinician investigator program. In addition to his clinical responsibilities, he directs a National Institutes of Health funded program that's aimed at understanding the pathogenesis of prediabetes and factors affecting uh, those cells that produce insulin and other hormones within the pancreas. He's an international expert also on the diagnosis of the opposite problem, namely uh, hypoglycemic disorders. Welcome, Dr. Vela. It's great to have you here. Thank you for having me. Yes, Dr. Vela and I were uh, colleagues for, for many years before I retired, and he's delightful. So we'll, we'll get right into this. Uh, Dr. Vela, tell us about diabetes. What, it, what is diabetes, and are there different types? Well, so diabetes, strictly speaking, means um, that you have high blood glucose. Um, the cause of that um, may differentiate the subtypes of diabetes, but ultimately um, it means that your blood sugar is high. Now the original term, and which we still use, diabetes mellitus, uh, the mellitus is a derivative of the Greek word for honey. And that's because when glucose gets beyond a certain concentration, it spills over into the urine and the urine basically is laden with glucose, which can be measured. Um, the first bioassay for that was that ants were attracted to diabetic urine because of the high glucose concentrations, um, okay. hence the term. But that's what diabetes is. Basically, your blood sugars are too high um, for what they should be. So maybe a way to trap ants in your home? And... Yes, uh, that would be a way. It might be a bit unhygienic, but it would be a way. Okay. So, but what you hear about type 1 and type yes. 2, and what, what are, what's that all about? So the fact that your blood sugars are high implies that you are not producing enough insulin to lower your blood sugars. Insulin is the hormone which stops production of glucose by mainly the liver, but also the kidneys. Um, and it also is a hormone which stimulates the uptake of glucose by tissues that are insulin sensitive, muscle being the predominant organ that is responsive to insulin. 
So if your blood sugars are high, your insulin is not enough to go around. Now that can be an absolute deficiency, which is what happens in type 1 diabetes, where the insulin producing cells are actually destroyed by the body's own immune system. Or else in type 2 diabetes, it's a relative deficiency. So the beta cell isn't making enough insulin at the right time. And when it makes that insulin, that insulin isn't working as well as it should to lower blood sugars. So type 2 diabetes is actually, from a pathophysiologic point of view, is actually an infinitely more interesting disease. Because interesting in the sense that interesting to people trying to figure it out. Um, because there are, there's both an insulin deficiency and there's also what we call an insulin resistance, i.e. insulin binds its receptor, but the effects aren't as pronounced as you would hope or expect. Okay. So we talked about the two major the different types of diabetes and how should, how should one go about being diagnosed with diabetes? How, is it is it on the rise? Is this something that's becoming more common? Are there reasons for that? Those are good questions. Um, it, it certainly has become more common uh, in the population. There are various reasons for that. Some are understood, some are not uh, as well understood. It certainly, to some extent, correlates with the incidence of obesity. Um, and uh, I think, you know, the, there is some evidence that perhaps the incidence has plateaued a bit mm -hmm. over the past five or six years, which is hopeful, um, but it's certainly more common. The other reason why it is more common is that the diagnostic criteria for the diagnosis of diabetes were loosened in 1996. So it's easier to make a formal diagnosis of diabetes uh, based on blood sugars than it was pre-1996. We hear about people going uh, to get their hemoglobin A1C yes. checked. Is that, is that important? Um, not as important as checking your fasting glucose. It's okay. actually a, a, a reasonable way to diagnose diabetes, but it's actually insensitive. And in the early phases of the disease, fasting glucose is much more sensitive to the diagnosis than A1C. The A1C, for those who don't know, um, is essentially a running average of your blood sugars over the previous three months, essentially. So glucose causes problems because it sticks to things. It sticks to blood vessels, it sticks to the retina, it sticks to the kidneys. That's how the complications of diabetes develop. In just the same way, it binds to hemoglobin. And since hemoglobin in blood cells has a, half -life, has a circulating time of about three months, the amount of glycosylation, the amount of glucose stuck the hemoglobin is a nice running average of glucose. Unfortunately, it's not very sensitive at the lower end. Mm -hmm. So it's a great way of monitoring diabetes, but it's not a great way for diagnosing it. And w when should patients start to be concerned that maybe there's something going on with my blood sugar? Well, hopefully, hopefully a diagnosis can be made before a patient develops symptoms. And for that, you know, um, there are recommendations as to having an annual uh, blood glucose checked, um, certainly above a certain age, if there are risk factors for diabetes, um, obesity, family history, etc. Uh, but if somebody starts to lose weight, uh, is thirsty all the time, and waking up several times at night to pee, uh, those are actually pretty significant symptoms and would imply the possible presence of diabetes. Okay. And is there a particular age group that we, we see type 2 diabetes versus type 1 diabetes? So, so broadly speaking, mm -hmm. you can categorize people. You could, you, you could say stereotype people based on their presentation. Mm -hmm. And stereotypes work because mm -hmm. often... They, they're, they're correct. Mm -hmm. The problem is that there are exceptions to that rule. So in, a, in actual fact, type 1 diabetes can occur at, early, at any age. My personal record is an 85-year-old who presented mm -hmm. with type 1 diabetes. But usually, type 1 diabetes develops in children and adolescents, although 
we do recognize that it happens across all ages. Type 2 diabetes is usually, usually a diagnosis of middle age or late middle age. But again, it's increasingly being seen in younger and younger adults. So there are children who sometimes, unfortunately, present with type 2 diabetes as well. Okay. Well, let's focus a bit on, on type 2 diabetes. And you've made the diagnosis. You don't always start treatment immediately, depending, I guess, depending on what the glucose level is, the blood sugar level. How do you decide when to start treatment and let's get into to treatment and what's new? Yes, um, so, so type 2 diabetes actually is a disease which unfortunately um, very often gets blamed on the patient. Um, and that the patient sometimes blames themselves as well. And there is, you know, a lifestyle element to developing diabetes. But if you think about it, it's also some degree of predisposition, which we do not completely understand. What I do like when, to when tell... When you say that, you mean there's a gene genetic genetics, component? Okay. Yes, um, other factors, environmental or otherwise, that we do not recognize at the present time. I always tell patients that if they go across to the other side of West 18, where we see uh, patients with diabetes, there's the bariatric clinic where people are being seen for possible weight loss surgery because mm -hmm. of excess weight. In those circumstances, only one third of patients actually have diabetes in that group. So again, it's emphasizing that even in that extreme of weight, not everybody is going to develop diabetes. In fact, a minority develop diabetes. Again, emphasizing how there are different responses to uh, lifestyle. So I think lifestyle is an important component. And when you see a patient who's newly diagnosed, we try and understand how much that can be changed and how much benefit we might expect from changing. Certainly somebody newly diagnosed with type 2 diabetes is at peak motivation to improve their lifestyle. And we should exploit that. And in the vast majority of uh, cases, for the first three months at least, I just would try intensive lifestyle and diet modification alone very often. And that, that often enough is enough. Is, is enough. Mm -hmm. Now, some people argue that you should start them on an oral medication up front. A pill. A pill, yeah. yes. Okay. Um, and the most common, at least most society position statements, would say metformin or glucophage uh, would be the first starting drug. But you could make an argument that early on, uh, you can try to see how much mileage you get with lifestyle alone. There are some situations where patients present with very severe symptoms and very high blood sugars. In those circumstances, very often, there is a phenomenon at play, which is called glucose toxicity, where because glucose has been high for an extended period of time, it actually interferes with the ability of the body to make insulin and to respond to insulin. And very often in those circumstances, mm -hmm. the only thing that's going to break that vicious cycle is to give insulin. So sometimes we do see people where we start insulin up front, at least for a short period of time, till we've reversed that so-called glucose toxicity, and then we can re revert to more conventional therapy for type 2 diabetes. Okay. And <clears throat> can weight loss actually make diabetes go away? So that's actually another interesting question okay. in and of itself, because if you get into the semantics, diabetes is defined by a high blood sugar. Mm -hmm. But the processes that lead to you having a high blood sugar in the first place probably don't reverse as much as we think they do mm. with weight loss. So weight loss can improve your blood sugars. But if you regained weight, you'd be back to where you were most of the time. Forgive me, you know this. I like to make car analogies very often. <laughs> um, so imagine that the cells making your insulin are the car's engine. And the glucose that the engine is trying to lower is the car's body, the car's weight that it's trying to move along. So you can cut holes in the body, you can remove doors, and you can make the car lighter and the engine will be less stressed. 
but the engine isn't functioning at its best already kind of thing. So if you stress it again, you'll be back at square one, okay. so to speak. Good. All right. Now, we, so we've talked about the oral agent, metformin, and you've talked about insulin, but it's, it's in terms of managing somebody with diabetes, type 2 diabetes long-term on insulin, it's, it's, there are many different types of insulin. And there are some new drugs as well that have yes, there come are. into play. There are several, and there are more. There are other oral agents other than metformin mm -hmm. too. Um, I think, I think ultimately it's a question of making the punishment fit the crime, so to speak, mm -hmm. in terms of what you use. I generally emphasize lifestyle a lot because if you don't do that. You know, it becomes mm -hmm. more difficult. You can add, ter you can throw therapy at the problem, um, but it's got to be helped along by lifestyle. And I think, and then ultimately what we want is we want to lower blood sugars safely and effectively. Um, so obviously we don't want patients to have the opposite of high blood sugar, which is low blood sugar, because that can have its own consequences. Um, we want the patient to be able to tolerate the medication without getting too much in the way of lifestyle. Um, and obviously, and then we want it to be effective in that it lowers blood sugars adequately and it prevents complications associated with chronic high blood sugars. So there are several classes of oral agents that can be helpful. Um, all of those oral agents require that the body at least be capable of making some insulin for them to work mm -hmm. at some level. Um, and then there are situations where insulin may be the most reasonable therapy alone or in combination with orals or this newer class of drugs that everybody talks about now, uh, which are the GLP-1 receptor agonists. GLP-1. Oh, <laughs> yes, that would be one of them. That would be one Semaglutide. of them. What's actually, what's actually little understood mm -hmm. is that the first member of that class was approved for use in April of 2005. Mm. They've been around for a while. Um, my first project uh, as a fellow in Dr. Reza's lab was to work with the native hormone, glucagon-like peptide 1. So I've been in that space for a lot longer than I I care to remember sometimes. How does it, how does it work? So GLP-1 is a hormone that originally uh, was, it's called GLP-1, it stands for glucagon-like peptide 1, because it's actually from the same parent gene as glucagon, and it has significant homology with glucagon. But the conventional thinking was that uh, the alpha cell in the pancreas takes proglucagon and makes glucagon. Whereas cells in the gut, L cells they are called, take proglucagon and make GLP-1. And GLP-1 would serve as a signal, okay? It's secreted in response to food ingestion. It says to the pancreas, food has been eaten, start making insulin. It's a powerful secretagogue of insulin. Mm -hmm. um, it also, when it um, gets through the satiety centers of the hypothalamus, it has a prominent anorectic effect. So it decreases hunger uh, and it makes you feel full. It can make you feel nauseous too, if you take too much of it. So those, na those effects of the natural hormone have been harnessed with analogs that can be given once a week, for example, or once a day, um, and produce these effects, which are glucose lowering. Very good. Let's, let's talk a little bit about some of the problems that you see associated with diabetes. You mentioned, you mentioned the eyes and the kidneys and the nerves and other things. What, what, uh, what kinds of things that we can do to try to prevent that, if that's possible, and how can we help patients along that have disorders of these other organ systems? Yeah, so... Um... So the best thing we can do is actually keep blood sugars as close to normal as is feasible and safe. Because we don't want, as I said before, we don't want to be causing hypoglycemia. Um, 
And in actual fact, in terms of severity and frequency of complications, we've certainly made great strides in that regard. Um, there are also adjunctive things we can do uh, to help prevent kidney failure requiring dialysis or eye disease that leads to blindness. Um, so in terms of preventing kidney failure, for example, we know that cholesterol-lowering drugs and more effective blood pressure-lowering medications all help along with uh, lowering blood sugars to prevent the progression of complications. So I think um, cardiovascular risk reduction is an important part. Mm -hmm. So controlling your blood pressure and your cholesterol is all part of that. But then to prevent these microvascular complications, controlling blood sugars safely and effectively will be very important. What about the eye, disease, eye disorders that you see associated with diabetes? Yeah, so again, um, there be, have been two revolutions in the past 30 years related to eye disease with diabetes. One is the use of um, laser photocoagulation mm -hmm. to uh, treat areas of the retina that are ischemic and prevent these fragile new blood vessels that develop, which can bleed and cause blindness or retinal detachment. The second is there's a new class of therapeutic agents which are often injected into the eye that inhibit a growth factor, which again causes these vessels to grow and you know, these leaky, fragile new vessels that lead to the complications of diabetes. So those two together have done a lot to prevent uh, severe end stage eye disease and blindness. Are patients with diabetes at increased risk for heart attack or they are. stroke, other forms of vascular disease? They are. So conventionally, um, you could describe vascular complications as macrovascular and microvascular, depending on the size of blood vessel affected. Conventionally, when we talk about, you know, cholesterol-associated uh, heart disease and uh, peripheral blood vessel disease, we're talking about the larger vessels, the arteries and arterioles. With diabetes, in addition to being at risk for disease in those large vessels, very often there is disease in the smaller circulation, the smaller blood vessels, and that's called microvascular disease. So um, one place where you can assess the state of the microvasculature visually is by looking uh, at the retina because it's the same caliber mm -hmm. of vessels and that might give you some idea about the degree of microvascular disease but those two things are affected in diabetes how so how frequently so someone is diagnosed with diabetes they're on insulin they're you know getting into their 60s and 70s and how often should they be seen how often should they have an eye exam or you know blood tests to look at kidney function well, so there, there, are, there are significant guidelines uh, in regards to that. Um, so, as I mentioned, we talked about the glycosylated hemoglobin, or A1C, um, which is a test that gives you an idea uh, of glucose control over three months. So you could make an argument that people with uh, fragile, with very labile diabetes could be seen every three months. Um, mm -hmm. Somewhere between three and six months is usually reasonable. Then there are people who, you know, have stable disease, are on one medication or no medication, and perhaps once a year is enough for those people too. So it varies from case to case. They cert certainly, uh, lipids, uh, blood pressure um, should be monitored at least once a year, if not more frequently. As regards screening for complications, um, so when we talk about eye disease screening, um, I think um, the recommendation is one year, okay, every year. Um, and certainly, usually complications require at least five years to develop. Mm -hmm. So if you can be pretty certain that you know when diabetes started, you could wait five years before starting to screen for mm -hmm. complications. With type 2 diabetes, we very often do not know when the actual onset of the disease occurred. Mm -hmm. um, so we usually recommend starting screening earlier. Um, but usually one to two years is a reasonable time 
to have an eye exam. Okay. So, um, any anything else you'd like to say about about diabetes to our public audience? Well, I think I think one of one 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 pet peeve of mine is that a lot of people um, spend an inordinate amount of time trying to decide whether they have they or their patients have type one or type two diabetes. In actual fact, sometimes you know I told you before about stereotypes at the extremes of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. About 10 to 20% of the time, you aren't actually completely sure which mm -hmm. diabetes you are dealing with. And many people make the argument, I'm one of them, that ultimately what you care about is controlling blood sugars safely and effectively. And perhaps it doesn't matter as much when you're in doubt kind of thing. And the whole goal is to control your blood sugars ultimately. Okay. Well, we actually have a... a couple of extra minutes, I thought maybe you'd like to talk a little bit about the, the opposite problem. I know that's an area that, uh, that you have worldwide recognition uh, in the management of this problem. And as we talked a little bit about diabetics on treatment that get low blood sugar, that's kind of a different thing. But what about patients that have organic causes for having low blood sugar? Hmm. Not, very, not very common, although I guess there's, there's some types of low blood sugar that are very common. Yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, low blood sugar, the commonest cause of low blood sugar is somebody taking medication for diabetes, either accidentally or on purpose to mm -hmm. cause hypoglycemia. Whether on purpose they actually take it or it's given to them um, with criminal intent. But once you exclude that, um, then true hypoglycemia, contrary to popular belief, is actually quite uncommon. Um, in fact, it's about four in a million. So I like to tell patients uh, who I see for hypoglycemia that I could see a million patients and without hearing anything about them, mm -hmm. tell them that they do not have hypoglycemia and only be wrong four times out of a million. Um, but joking apart, I think it's important to understand that to make a diagnosis of hypoglycemia, it's important that in addition to having the symptoms which are rather non-specific and might be describing a panic attack as well as a low blood sugar, uh, you have a low blood sugar accompanying those symptoms. And correction of that low blood sugar should correct those symptoms. If you fulfill that, then you can make a diagnosis of hypoglycemia. And in most healthy people who are walking into the clinic with a diagnosis or documented hypoglycemia, the usual diagnosis is a little tumor on the pancreas called an insulinoma. Never heard of it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Except when I called you to remove them. Um, and we would do that about 30 mm -hmm. times a year on average, I would say. Yeah. Um, um, so, yes. So, so and the first case was at Mayo Clinic. The first case was at Mayo Clinic. Yeah. And uh, um, that built the tradition. And that is why yeah. I have a practice where I can say that I see 30 insulinomas a year where people sometimes go through life without ever having seen an insulinoma. So I'm very privileged in that regard. Um, well, Dr. Vela, um, thank you so much. It's uh, really been enlightening having you here and talking about this all too common and serious health problem. I'm sure our audience uh, will find this discussion uh, most interesting. And thank you for your time and thank you for being here it's today. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Yep.